Land Rover is not typically the type of car brand that makes significant changes to their vehicles very often. Using the flagship Range Rover nameplate as an example, this car brand typically doesn't see changes for the better part of a decade. Now, the Range Rover sub brand has been hugely successful for Land Rover across the globe, especially here in America, where the company typically moves about 90,000 units of the Sport every year. Which brings me to the completely refreshed 2020 Range Rover Sport MHEV that I'm showing you here. For 2018, Land Rover gave it a significant overhaul on the front and the rear and on the interior. And earlier this year, they replaced the old supercharged V6 with an all new in-house designed three liter turbocharged inline six cylinder engine to improve power, improve fuel economy, and improve emissions. So with hot new competition in the form of the BMW X5, Mercedes-Benz GLE, and the all new Audi Q8, does the Land Rover Range Rover Sport still have what it takes to attract those brand conscious buyers into showrooms? That's what we're here to find out. Now in the luxury space, there are often a lot of choices for buyers, and I'm not talking about the actual make and models, I'm talking about what's going on underneath the hood. Now underneath the hood of the current Range Rover Sport, Land Rover offers a choice of six different powertrains. That's right, I said six, and I could probably honestly do a video on all six engines by itself, so I'm gonna try to condense it down to the engine that I'm showing you here. This is an all new engine for 2019. It replaces the old three liter supercharged V6, which definitely had a lot of character, but it was essentially the old V8 with two cylinders lopped off. So it wasn't the most refined engine. It wasn't the most fuel efficient engine. This is a clean sheet design built in house by Land Rover at their engine factory in the UK. It's a three liter turbocharged inline six cylinder engine. So the old V6 configuration is gone, replaced by a smooth inline six, which is uh, boosted by a single, tur single turbo with a twin scroll design. It's also supercharged as well. So this is kind of taking a, a playbook out of Volvo. So it has an electric supercharger, which can spool up its turbines uh, in 0.5 seconds to help mitigate the lag and to improve the efficiency. This is also a mild hybrid. That's what MHEV basically stands for. It has a 48 volt mild hybrid system, which takes the kinetic energy from the brakes, stores it into a battery, helps with the restart, making it much more smoother and also helps kind of power the vehicle at low speeds in combination with the engine to help this vehicle feel very lag free. It all sounds very nice, which I'll talk about the driving dynamics later on. Basically what you need to know, 355 horsepower and 365 pound-feet of torque. That's an increase of 15 horsepower versus the old 340 horsepower supercharged V6. And there's also two tunes for this engine, P360, which is the one I'm showing you here, and the HST version will offer a P400, which frustratingly has 395 horsepower. So it's not technically um, meaning that it has 400 horsepower or 360 horsepower. Uh, if you guys are looking for more power, there's up to 575 horsepower in the SVR version. That's a different review. And there's also an electrified uh, plug-in hybrid version, which is new for 2020 called the P400E. That's again, a different review. Um, that one will offer almost 400 horsepower. But as this one sits, it weighs uh, a little under 5,000 pounds. The Range Rover Sport all goes out through an eight-speed ZF sourced automatic. It'll tow a maximum of 7,716 pounds. And because this is a new engine, its fuel economy has been improved to 19 in the city, 25 on the highway. Please be sure to make premium put premium gas in this thing. It is an improvement versus the old supercharged V6 uh, by about 3 mpg. Now, besides having a very strong brand image here in America, the other part that makes the Range Rover nameplate so successful in the States is the styling of this vehicle. Now, Land Rover doesn't make significant changes to this car very often. And when they introduced this all new version back in 2014, it was a handsome car. So for 2018, they made some slight tweaks to the vehicle, but you really have to squint at it to see all the changes they've made. Let me go over a couple of things here. This particular one here is the HSE version. So it's kind of the mid trim. The base SE will have a slightly different look to the front fascia. In this particular Forenzi red exterior color, which is, seven, which is a $710 option, it looks fantastic to me with the black accents. Now, one of the big changes they made uh, last year is the addition of these new updated full LED headlights. You can see you have an LED turn signal. You have these LED daytime running lights, LED low and high beams. They also are adaptive, so they swivel in the direction of whatever you're going to turn the wheel in. And you also have these lower LED fog lights at the front fascia as well down here, which are very nicely integrated 
very well hidden. I especially like all the uh, grill intakes that this vehicle has. They're all functional, as you can see, helps cool the engine. This engine's going to need a lot of cooling. There is a front camera here on this particular one because it has the 360 camera option, these nicely integrated parking sensors, and Land Rover made their automatic emergency braking as standard equipment for the 2020 model year. From the side profile, Land Rover has maintained the squared off look with that rectangular boxy shape that we know and love on this vehicle. And the Sport, like I said, is the middle child in the Range Rover family. It's about five inches shorter than the Big Daddy Range Rover, but at 192 inches long, this is definitely the perfect midsize option for a lot of people here in America, which is probably why it sells so well. Its wheelbase remains the same as a, the Big Daddy Range Rover at 115 inches long overall. Compared to the new Range Rover Velar, which I still need to show you guys a video on that, that. This is about three inches longer than the Velar. It also stands taller. It has an adjustable air suspension that we all know and love. This, uh, this particular ride height is set at the normal setting. It offers about 8.4 inches of ground clearance. If you raise it up to the off-road setting, you should get around 11 inches of ground clearance. There's also an access height, which will lower this to help short people like myself get into this vehicle. Now, my tester here has an optional 21-inch wheel for like 2,500 bucks. They're wrapped in 275 Pirelli Scorpio tires. You can see massive brakes behind uh, the actual wheel design. It's definitely a really attractive looking car. I especially like it with the black contrasting roof that my tester has. It has the panoramic sunroof, the black mirrors, the black accents on the lower skirt. This is definitely still a very handsome looking car. So Land Rover did a great job with keeping this thing looking fresh over the years. From the rear of the new Range Rover, only the enthusiasts are really going to spot the differences between this and the pre-refreshed models. You can see the taillights are the biggest indication. They have been slightly tweaked for 2018. There's a full LED taillight design, as you can see, and it's also still a relatively handsome vehicle. The Range Rover is proudly spelled out across the back of this vehicle, just like it is on the front. Down here, you can see the rear fascia has been slightly tweaked. There's these new uh, integrated exhaust tips, which I know you guys are probably curious. Let's take a listen to see what that inline six cylinder engine sounds like. Now the old supercharged V6 was a little bit rough around the edges, but it definitely had a lot of character. This new one is a lot smoother, a lot more refined, and I am kind of missing it, but we'll go into the test drive uh, later on. Now opening up the lift gate, my tester has a power rear hatch, and unlike the Big Daddy Range Rover, it is not available with the split tailgate design, which some of you may very well miss. But looking at the space back here, you can see it's pretty good. Um, you get just under 30 cubic feet of space. My tester is missing the optional $3,000 third row seat, which would shrink the cargo capacity Capacity. Remember, the Sport is the only one in the Range Rover family that offers that third row option. If you fold down the second row seats, Land Rover says you get around just under 60 cubic feet of space, which is a little bit less than what you're going to get from something like a BMW X5 or Volvo XC90 or the Mercedes-Benz GLE. Now, underneath the floor here, you can see my tester does not have the optional full-size spare wheel with the matching tire, but you can see that's definitely not uh, a very small spare tire and most and the fact that Land Rover still offers that option considering that most vehicle manufacturers are going away from a spare tire really shows that they are serious about their off-road credentials because you wouldn't want to be stuck off-road in a vehicle like this without a full-size spare tire. So you're going to be spending most of your time on the interior of the 2020 Range Rover Sport. So let's hop into the inside and see the changes. I want to first show you guys the key fob for this vehicle. You can see it is a very heavy and large key fob. You can see it's got the traditional lock unlock buttons, a uh, panic button. You can open up the tailgate. Um, this vehicle does have the smart key access system. So all you have to do is keep the key fob in your pocket or your purse. As you approach the door handle, you can see just touch that little area over there. The mirrors will electrically fold in. And then Land Rover does a sensor on the back of the handle. Just touch the back of the handle and that will unlock the door for you. Now, my tester here has an optional uh, shade of a two-tone interior with the ivory and black accents. It looks phenomenal with this red exterior color. You can see there's some white leather on the door panels here. This door panel here is practically stitched on the upper portion, but it is a cheaper hard touch plastic down there, which at this vehicle's price is a little inexcusable. My tester also has the upgraded 17 speaker Meridian sound system, which sounds phenomenal. It's actually a bargain at like $1,500 extra. Now my tester also has uh, the optional 16 way power adjustable seat with a three person memory on both sides of the front seats, which is nice. The seats are heated and cooled and Land Rover does offer a massaging function if you guys go for the autobiography edition. This HSE version does not offer the massaging seats, but as you can see at a glance, it is a refreshed interior and it still makes a great first impression. Now getting inside, 
Um, you can lower out the ride height if you'd like to an access level to help shorter people like myself get in. When you close the door and shut it, it has a really nice solid thunk. And my tester has the optional soft close feature for 600 bucks. So all you have to do is just click the door and that will also shut the door, uh, which is frustrating because it's not uh, standard. It's optional now to start the vehicle up. You guys know how to start a vehicle up. Just put your foot on the brake, push the button up here to fire up the engine. Now, as you can see, there are not one, not two, but three screens in this vehicle, uh, which can be like screen overload for some of you who don't like all this tech. This digital display here is 12 inches. It has been slightly updated where you can reconfigure the display. You can see I have it in a display where it shows the nav, your driver assistance, and then the center, it shows a speedo um, or attack with a digital speedometer. This uh, InTouch uh, Control Duo Pro, this is updated. This was new for 2018. It does now finally include Android Auto and Apple Car CarPlay, which is standard equipment for the 2020 model year, which is nice. Um, previously, you couldn't even get Apple CarPlay and the, the uh, in-touch controlled uh, Pro with the old system. Um, Land Rover has basically replaced the old um, uh, controls the old regular buttons, hard buttons here with a touch sensitive panel, which we'll go into that in just a moment. Let me first talk about the interior materials. You can see the dash is all stitched. It's all soft leather. There's soft leather on this part of the dash. Uh, the vehicle actually has two glove boxes where if you push this at one top arrow, it opens up a dash, a glove box over there, which is damped and lined with felt. This lower portion here is also damped and lined with felt. You can see the activity key where it basically is like a Fitbit where the key is can get wet. Um, you can keep that key fob on you and then leave the actual large key fob in the vehicle. If you guys are going surfing, for example, you're going to get all wet. Um, the steering wheel, as you can see, is heated, which is nice. It is power, tilt, and telescoping, which Land Rover puts the control over on the right side, which is kind of annoying. I was looking for it on the left side at first. Um, you have these new touch-sensitive buttons um, on the steering wheel, which is new this year. You can see your heated steering wheel button is right there. Uh, one thing I like about it is like the volume control. You can kind of just rotate your hand around this, or you can just push this button here if you'd like. So there's several different ways. You can also skip the track. There's a favorite button over here, your Bluetooth, your voice commands, pushing the menu button here, you can see uh, this is where it allows you to change the different you know, ways that this looks. You can adjust the trip computer. You can show different warnings and whatnot. So this is all very modern. It takes a little bit of getting used to. So if you guys aren't really used to technology, let me show you guys really quickly how to adjust the layout of this display. So right now I have it on the one dial. Most of you will probably prefer the two dial setup where it looks like this. <clears throat> I'll probably leave it like that for the uh, rest of the drive portion. You can see it'll show the Land Rover icon in between the two screens. You can't actually put the GPS in the middle there like you can on some competitors, but it's nice that Land Rover has adjusted the custom customization of this. Now, above me over there, you can see there is a head-up display. It's a small head-up display. Some competitors offer larger ones uh, for sure. And then over here, this is the um, infotainment system here. I wanna first show you guys the Apple CarPlay. Now, pushing this little button over here, Oh, wow, this thing doesn't want to work when I want the car play to work. Hello, bitch. Now coming to the screen here, you can see this is the way it looks like when you have the Apple CarPlay enabled. I like how it takes up the entire screen, but it's still a little bit laggy at times. Uh, Land Rover says they have beefed up the processor for this vehicle's infotainment system now, so it should be quicker to use. But I'm still not particularly in love with how laggy and slow it can be at times. I think that Land Rover could still do the, you know, a little bit more to increase the processing speed. You can see going over here, this is the embedded GPS, which again, works relatively well. Um, it takes up the entire screen if you'd like. You can see it works like a tablet. You can pinch, you can zoom, you can swipe. This I'm noticing is much quicker in terms of response, but uh, at startup, I did notice this, this screen takes a little bit of time still to completely start up, which is a little bit um, annoying. Now over here, you can see, if you want, you can change you know, some of your different settings over here. You can access different vehicle functions. The 4x4i, this is something that the old one um, also offered where you can kind of go to an off-road page. It has weight sensing that this vehicle will drive through deep water if you guys uh, tick that specific option. There's also a dedicated back button there on the screen. You can see I tapped it there, but it didn't actually work. Drive assist, it'll show all your different camera modes because remember my tester has the optional 360 camera. So again, the infotainment screen in this vehicle still looks very nice. Um, but just know that it's still not quite as snappy as I would like. Now coming down to this screen here, uh, I really like the way this looks. It's a very clean 
integrated design. And some of you may actually snark at me because I don't like the two screen layout in something like an Acura. But in this particular vehicle, I think Land Rover did a really good job with just the overall look here and how flush it looks. Also, the screen itself looks beautiful. The graphics look good. It looks very high quality. It just could be a little bit faster. Now over here, you can see here's your climate uh, options over here. Um, you can go adjust your seat options here for your heated seat. There's still a dedicated hard button here where you can adjust the climate over here, or you can also push down and it'll go to your heated seat or your cooled seat, which still is a little bit too laggy at times. Pushing the vehicle setting over here, you can see this is where you can adjust your auto terrain response. Um, you can turn off the auto start stop. It used to be a dedicated button. Now it's actually in the screen, which is a little bit more um, annoying. And then going over here to your settings, you can change, you know, the way this looks when you first start it up. You can adjust the climate. And if you guys like, Land Rover offers basically a light or a dark mode. This is the way the dark mode looks where it's completely blacked out. You can also change it to a light mode where this is a very bright screen. Um, I personally prefer uh, the dark mode versus the light mode. So that's to keep that in mind. Looking down here, you can see this is the shifter for the eight-speed automatic transmission. If you put the vehicle into reverse, you can see it gives you a 360 camera um, with parking sensors front and rear. Put it to drive. It'll also still show you your camera with the front view with the parking sensors. Push that button here for P for park. This shifter hasn't changed from the pre-refreshed models. Um, this is the terrain response mode system. You can see you can change between different drive modes um, or you can just push it down and leave it in auto. There is a low range transfer case. This actually does have a real four wheel drive system. Your adjustable air suspension is here, hill descent control, and then you have your electronic parking brake. Open this up, you can see there is a nice cup holder area here. This is your really only storage. The lack of storage in this vehicle is kind of a problem for me. I wanted a little bit more storage solution. The signature fold down armrest here hasn't changed. And then if you open this up, you can see very small storage area. And then my tester has an optional refrigerator basically uh, and when you have this turned on to its highest setting it does get very cold but this also eats up into your center console storage space for an extra 350 bucks it's a nice option to have but just know that some competitors offer a little bit more storage solution i really like this new feature over here when you look at this area there's a big black panel here and you're wondering why is there a black panel well that's because you can see this panoramic sunroof uh, on my tester is massive and if you just kind of wave your hand that way it has gesture control so when i did that the screen or the sunshade is actually starting to close. And if I wanted to, I can just wave my hand back. It doesn't always work, but once you wave it backwards, you can see the sunshade goes in the opposite direction. So I imagine this completely black area here is for the sensor uh, for the gesture controls, which gesture controls are very gimmicky. BMW kind of still has a problem with theirs. So just keep that in mind. So overall the interior, very nice looking, high quality materials for the most part. Lots of great tech, uh, but it is still a little bit too laggy. I wish Land Rover would beef up the speed a little bit more. But overall, a lot of you are going to find a lot to like with the interior of this uh, Range Rover Sport. Now, as the middle child in the Range Rover family, hopping into the second row reveals a pretty good amount of space back here. Although, I had trouble finding the actual numbers. Uh, Land Rover doesn't seem to post the actual rear legroom in terms of inches, like most of the competition, so I could, couldn't find that on their site. But getting back here, you can see, I would probably say this car has around 36, 37 inches of legroom, which does feel a little bit tight because some competitors like the BMW X5 offers nearly 40 inches of legroom. The one thing that also surprised me, these seats, they do recline slightly. If you pull this lever, you can kind of recline them back and recline them forward a little bit but they don't actually slide forward and back which really surprised me i was expecting this seat to slide back to give you know the second row passengers more space i suspect if you guys go for the third row seat option they may give you that feature but without it you just have basically fixed second row seats that only recline now looking at some of the features you can see there are two map pockets over here the door panels are covered in the same leather that you get from the front seat so it's a very high quality interior back here uh, the panoramic sunroof as you can see adds a lot of natural light which is good and then you have rear seat air vents uh, my tester has the four zone climate control with the heated and cooled second row seats so these seats are also heated they're also cooled three ways just like the front that is a 1250 uh, option you also have two usb ports over here uh, and then you have a regular household power outlet and then if you fold down this thing right here you can see there are these nice um, or it's a nice armrest with two cup holders and Land Rover also gives you a little bit of storage back here so overall if you're looking for the biggest back seat the Range Rover Sport doesn't fit the bill but it is going to be usable for most families
So it has been quite a few years since I drove a Range Rover Sport. The last time Land Rover lent me one was probably about two years ago. Uh, I also did a review on the channel for a supercharged V8, which I honestly fell in love with. I have briefly driven the SVR, I've driven the TD6, but this all new MHEV, this electrified, supercharged and turbocharged option definitely takes a page out of Volvo's playbook. Um, but Land Rover, of course, they did it their own way. It's an in-house designed engine. The engine itself is, uh, you know, the mid-engine, as I said multiple times. 355 horsepower, 365 foot-pounds of torque. Those are decent numbers, uh, but this vehicle, keep in mind, weighs over 5, 000, almost 5,000 pounds. So you do feel the weight of this car when you are behind the wheel. I mean, the one thing about Range Rovers in general is I love the commanding view of the road that you get. You just sit up really high. The seats are comfortable. Um, you have this amazing view out of the front, out of the back. The side mirrors are large. Uh, my tester has the driver assist pro package, so it has all the fancy driver assistance stuff where the full speed range adaptive cruise, the active lane keep assist, the blind spot monitoring, which is standard, by the way and the top 360 camera. Overall, this car, even though it is getting up there in the uh, years, still feels really fresh. So I, I applaud Land Rover for keeping this car, you know, still very nice on the inside and on the outside. It definitely still has a lot of presence to it and it will turn a lot of heads wherever you take this thing. <laughs> now, for a base engine, I have to say when this turbo kicks in um, when the supercharger's on full boil, the turbo's on full boil. This thing feels quick. Now, Landover says you'll get to 60 in around six, six seconds for this mid P360 model. The, three, eight, or the 400 version should do it in under six, like 5.9 seconds. Uh, it is a slight improvement over the old supercharged V6. But for all the fancy gag gadgetry and the witchcraft with the, you know, twin charge aspect, the electrification, there is a noticeable delay in acceleration. This thing is a little soft below 3000 RPM. It actually feels a little light on torque, which is kind of frustrating considering all the, you know, stuff they were going over about how, you know, the, it's mitigating the lag or it's like it's filling in the gaps that you'll feel. There is still a place for the SVR with its supercharged V8, obviously, but for most buyers, you're gonna find plenty to like. The eight-speed auto in this car is also a very good dance partner. It you know, goes through the gears very nicely, it's responsive, but you just can't get around the fact that this vehicle weighs 5,000 pounds. It feels like it's a little light on torque at times for me. There's the power above three, but God, that's a smooth engine. The old supercharged V6 definitely was a little rough sounding at times, that is no longer the case with this motor. It is a smooth engine that a lot of you are going to love revving the crap out of. Soft power. It revs all the way to 6,500. And, you know, honestly, for a straight six, it basically meets my expectations for smoothness. Uh, it could be a little bit, there could be a little bit more noise. There was more character that you had with the old V6. Uh, and of course, if you guys want even more character, there is the V8. There are no paddles on the wheel for this particular version. So instead, if you want to access the manual mode, you have to use the, the manual sh or the shifter over here. But yeah, I mean, those of you who liked the old supercharged V6, you're going to find this to be a little bit too quiet too refined, but those of you who like a straight six, you're gonna love the smoothness of this engine. You know, it pulls all the way to that 6,500 RPM red line. There's no vibration, there's no harshness that you get. Um, but I do wish it had a little bit more noise, maybe some crackles and pops. That's the reason why you may wanna go for the uh, supercharged V8 that you can get, you know, in the other you know, versions of this car. Now, in terms of handling, this is the Range Rover Sport but I wouldn't go so far to call this thing a sports sedan. It definitely feels big. The suspension is soft. The steering is relatively numb. It's also a very thin rimmed steering wheel. So you're not gonna you know, feel like you're gonna be attacking your favorite back roads in this thing or hustling it. That's the reason why the SVR exists. Um, but as a comfortable daily driver, that's where the sport really excels. You know, these seats are extremely comfortable. You can also get them a massaging option if you'd like. The engine is very quiet. There's very little in terms of road noise, in terms of engine noise, in terms of wind noise. It just goes down the road with a solidity that you expect a Range Rover to have. It feels like a very solid 
car, a very sure-footed car, a very heavy car. And that's what really attracts people to this vehicle. I mean, commanding view of the road, high quality feel, you know, built like a tank. Uh, and you can also take this thing almost anywhere. It's got the off-road chops, it's got the on-road handling dynamics, uh, it's got a real low-range transfer case. And um, for those of you who don't require the you know, absolute brute force in terms of acceleration, this straight six is a willing partner. Uh, I just think that I need to drive the HST version with the extra 40 horsepower and maybe hopefully a little bit more noise. But overall, I'm still relatively impressed with this car in lieu of new, in the light of new competition like the X5, the GLE. There's still something about this car. Those are the two most recent ones that I've driven. Um, this car still has enough character in it to keep people coming into the Land Rover showrooms, you know, until an all new generation comes out in the next coming years. So as the best-selling model in the Land Rover lineup, the Range Rover Sport has to satisfy a lot of people's expectations. And as you can see, the latest 2020 version definitely does a great job at being an amazing all-around car for a lot of families or a lot of people in general here in America. It has a very comfortable interior with lots of room. It has decent power from its three liter turbocharged inline six. It has a really cushy ride quality, which will handle those city potholes that you constantly have to deal with, or if you want to take this vehicle off road with the adjustable air suspension. It has a look that will continue to stand out because the Range Rover sub brand here in America has a lot of cachet with a lot of brand conscious buyers, and it has to do with the styling. It has to do with the heritage. It has to do with the brand image, which is why you don't typically see this car change in terms of its design very often. Now Land Rover obviously made some very calculated changes to the vehicle over the years, the interior being that huge upgrade, especially with that new in-touch control Duo Pro infotainment system with the two screens. It works well, it's a little bit quicker, it has Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. And really my only gripe comes to down to the fact that Land Rover itself is definitely not a cheap date if you guys are looking to put these in your driveway. And it's also a car brand that, not that doesn't typically have the stellar reputation for reliability, which is why people who typically buy these get these things new and lease it and then replace it every uh, three years whenever the lease is up before the warranty expires. So with all that said, it's time to give the 2020 Range Rover Sport an RPM rating because I've had this vehicle for a week. Let's start with the R for real world usage. I'm going to give this car a nine out of 10 points simply because it's an SUV. It has available third row. It has plenty of space on the inside. So a lot of families are going to find this very useful. Moving on to the E for efficiency. I'm going to give this car a six out of 10 points for efficiency because they did improve the gas mileage this year with this new engine. And if you guys go for the plug-in hybrid, but I only averaged around 17 MPG in my week's worth of testing. This thing's definitely not a cheap date and you have to also put a uh, premium gas in it. It has a 27 gallon gas tank, which does give you long fill-ups, but it's gonna cost you a lot of money when you actually do plan to fill this thing up. Now moving on to the D for desirability. The Range Rover name definitely is still a desirable vehicle. I'm gonna give this car a nine out of 10 points for desirability, simply because it still attracts a lot of attention everywhere I took it, and people still have an urge to want to own one of these things or at least lease it if you guys have the cash uh, to afford it. Now moving on to the L for longevity. This is where the Land Rover brand has some work to do with build quality, which is actually pretty good, but in terms of long-term reliability, I'm gonna give this car a three out of 10 points for longevity because this is something that I would lease. I would not wanna keep these things after the warranty is expired because there is a lot of maintenance there are a lot of electrical issues because of all the high tech stuff that they put in this car. So just keep that in mind if you guys are interested in purchasing one of these things used. Moving on to the I for innovation, I'm gonna give this thing an eight out of 10 points because there are a lot of fancy tech equipment in this vehicle from the adjustable air suspension to that new infotainment system, to the gesture controls for the power sunshade, to the full LED headlights that swivel, to that new electrified turbocharged, supercharged engine underneath the hood. And you can also get this thing in a plug-in. I'm gonna easily give this an eight out of 10 points uh, for innovation. Moving on to the N for need for speed. This is the mid-level option. It does zero to 60 in around six seconds. I found the power to be adequate, still not super fast, you're going to want to go for the supercharged V8 if you want to really impress people for its exhaust noise, noise and how fast it can get to 60. I'm going to give this uh, particular version a 7 out of 10 points for need for speed. Keep in mind, if you had the SVR version, I would easily give it an extra point or two. Now, of course, last but not least, the final E for expense. This is an expensive car. It starts at $68,500 for the base SE. Four-wheel drive is standard. You do get a lot of standard equipment. The HSE version here is going to cost you at least $74,000. Now, this is where things get rather pricey because my tester has roughly about twenty-five. dollars 
thousand dollars in options in this thing for a total ass tested price of just under ninety seven thousand dollars so nearly a hundred grand for a car that doesn't even have the baddest engine now of course keep in mind i did test a mercedes-benz gle 450 which was also almost a hundred thousand dollars so land rover has basically priced it right with the competition but for those of you who don't typically buy cars in this segment are going to be in for some sticker shock. So I'm going to give this thing a four out of 10 points for the expense category. Now add it all up and you get a grand total of 46 out of 70 points, uh, which is actually a point higher than a Jeep Wrangler e-torque unlimited Rubicon that I last tested earlier this year which it makes sense to me. This is a car that's a little bit more impressive than the Jeep, but you can't quite do all the off-road things. It doesn't have quite the, you know, um, let's go take the top off and drive this, drive that thing across a Rubicon trail, but you will do this in luxury and comfort in British quality that a lot of you are know, are know that and love from the Land Rover brand. So if you guys are interested in purchasing a vehicle like this, just know that the current 2020 Range Rover Sport still deserves to be at the very top of your list. Just be sure to get rid of it before the warranty is up. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on this 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Sport HSE. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews. Like us on Facebook. And as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.